Welcome to the Anthony and Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence podcast. I'm Riman Ramcharita, and today we will be speaking with Dr. Richie Robertson, our 2014 Laureate in Science and Technology, a native of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who is also one of the region's leading volcano experts. He is employed at UWI's Seismic Research Center. Dr. Robertson, you are on the ground. Could you tell us what's going on in St. Vincent in terms of the eruption right now? Right. At present, what you have is what we call magma or, or material from beneath the surface of the Earth. The genesis of, of everything really is this magma. And the magma is slowly coming onto the surface of the Earth. And as it comes out, it forming a, a, a lava, what we call a lava dome, essentially a mass of, of hard rock. Uh, that is building up in the southwestern part of the crater in St. Vincent. St. Vincent Volcano has a summit crater, which is about one and a half kilometers in, in its maximum width. Um, and on the southwestern part of it, there's a mass of rock that is essentially is growing. And that mass of rock is coming from magma that is coming slowly from beneath the surface and adding to that mass. This has been going on since about the 27th, well, the 27th of December, as far as we could determine, that's when it started. Um, and it has continued to slowly build and get bigger and bigger over the last month and a, and a bit. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's been happening. It's, had, it's called an effusive eruption, not an explosive eruption, which is what it was Sufre did last time. It had an explosive eruption. This time it hasn't happened an effusive eruption. Okay, but I imagine with that hardening cap on the orifice that the, the magma comes out of, will pressure be building? Is there a danger? of an explosive eruption rather than an effusive eruption? Well, there's, there's always um, a possibility that, that any eruption could go explosive. And, and, and Sufre and St. Vincent has traditionally, well, I shouldn't say traditionally, from since probably for about the last 4,000 years or so, it has had either what is called an explosive eruption or an effusive eruption. It has either had an eruption in which material has come out quickly and, and fragmented and, and caused explosions, which has, has, has impacted a, a wide area in, in northern part of St. Vincent, or else it's quite, come out quietly. Now, in 79, the first part of the eruption was explosive, and then the latter part of the eruption, the last three or four months or so, it, it slowly grew a dome. So, in fact, for the last 41 years or so, you have actually had, in, in your terminology, a cap, in a sense, on the, on the volcano. You have had a dome there. And, and up until the fusive eruption started, I think most of the scientists, including myself, who would have been monitoring the volcano, would have expected the next thing to happen is an explosive eruption. But it hasn't. So it has, it has an effusive eruption ongoing. Um, you know, that one can say to a certain extent that that may or may not marginally increase the chances of an explosive eruption. But in any case, an explosive eruption from Sufre was something that we would not be surprised about um, in the near future. This particular eruption, we would not be surprised if it if it continues and it becomes explosive at some point. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons that we monitor it and look at it closely is really to be able to determine if it's heading in that direction to give the authorities some, some warning that that's the direction it's going in. Okay, what would be the consequences to the island if it were to explode? If it gets explosive, it means that it could, it could push material much further afield. Um, in, in, given what we expect from Sufre, that means that certainly the volcano itself, which occupies the northern one third of the island, would become very dangerous and people would have to move off of it. And in fact, to be extra safe, you'd probably have to move people a little bit further south. So you could think of sort of the, the northern one third of the island will have to be evacuated if it's an explosive eruption. Um, that is in terms of St. Vincent. But an explosive eruption has the potential to produce a lot of ash. And ash gets really anywhere the wind blows it. So an explosive eruption from Sufre has wider impact than St. Vincent itself. It has impacts for the region. And what would some of the impacts of that ash um, dispersing across the region be? The ash affects aviation traffic. It affects the flight of planes. Um, air, 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 airline engines do not function well in volcanic ash. And often when they have a volcanic ash um, you know, in the atmosphere, the, the planes either try to avoid it or they just simply don't fly. Um, so that we'd expect that, that explosive eruptions from Sufre or from any of the volcanoes in the region, in fact, would have an impact on the aviation traffic. Um, depend on, depending on where the ash goes, depending on the size of the explosion, um, depending on the wind direction, that, that impact could be, be wider 
a feel. Um, if you think of, of um, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, there was an, an, an Icelandic um, volcano that erupted and it basically closed aviation traffic throughout Europe and caused billions of dollars of, of, uh, in, in terms of economic impact. Um, in the region, volcanic eruptions erupting explosively and Sufre can have severe impacts on aviation traffic and their extension on, on the economics in the region. What about right. health and other issues of, uh, of an ash dispersion? In terms of the ash, the ash could have, particularly people who have asthmatic and respiratory problems, fine ash is not very comfortable to, to, um, to sort of breathe in. Uh, so they will have challenges for people who are particularly prone to respiratory problems. But there are, there are things that one can do, you know, the same similar kinds of, of protection that we use for, in fact, COVID, the masks that you wear, are uh, similar kinds of things that you would you would do to minimize the impact of volcanic gas. So, yes, it can has, have some health impacts on people particularly who are prone to asthma and other respiratory problems. It can, has, it can have also have impact, depending on the thickness of the ash, on agriculture. Um, so it can have that kind of impact. It, it could potentially get into water supplies. It could have that kind of impact. So it could have impact on people as well as on aviation traffic. It all depends on how, how much ash falls, and that in itself depends both on the size of the eruption, the, big, the, the size of the explosion, as well as, more importantly, on the direction of the wind. Okay, so that's the volcano in St. Vincent. Uh, there was one in Montserrat recently, yep. if, if I recall. And you just mentioned active volcanoes in the region. How many active volcanoes are there in the region? Well, it depends on, on, on what you define a volcano as. Um, it, it could move from, it could range from about, you could count it as 19 or it can reach up to 21. And that has to do with whether or not you take you consider a volcano as the single mountain, or, or you can consider a volcano of a group of mountains. You have a volcanic complex, which may consist of different mountains. Um, in, in total, you have at least one volcano in every one of the islands, going from Grenada all the way up to Seba and Stacia. At least one volcan one mountain that we think could potentially erupt in the future. In the case of Little Lake Dominica, you have a little bit more than that. Dominica have about um, nine, um, you know, vol um, potential centers that can erupt. So at least on every island, going from on, uh, on the, if you think of it, from Sabre, Stacia, um, and, and you come down the islands all the way to Grenada, you have at least that can erupt. You could get up to 19 or as much as 21, depending on how you count them. So you have quite a lot. For the last generation or so, we have had a few eruptions but they haven't yeah. really been presented to the Caribbean people uh, danger. Is that, would you say that's true? Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing in the region that because of the fact that we are all independent, um, that affects the way in which we see the hazards. And, and it, has to, it, it also impacts on how we perceive, in fact, earthquake hazard too. So the dangers to the... How people perceive, say, if you're in Trinidad, for example, where you don't have any volcanoes, the, when the volcano erupts in St. Vincent, is not perceived as a Trinidad problem, or is not perceived as a Barbados problem, but because we're all independent and different. So the perception of the hazard is less than it actually is. The fact is, we do have dangerous volcanoes in the region. And in fact, the, the first time scientists understood and, and recognized the scientific, the, the, scientifically, one of the most dangerous things from volcanoes was actually from the 1902 eruption in Mount Pile in Martinique and, and the Sufra eruption that followed so, shortly after. They, 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 they realized the, the potential and understood fully the potential of these things we call paraclastic flows, the, the French call nuit à don, or, or glowing avalanches. Um, you know, scientists these days call them paraclastic density current. Um, but what I'm saying is that it's in the region that it was realized how dangerous these things were because they killed so much people in Martinique the 1982 eruption also killed people in St. Vincent. So the volcanoes in the region, when they erupt, they can erupt explosively. Often the kind of explosive eruptions that you have from volcanoes, in fact, subduction zone volcanoes like we have in the region are some of the most dangerous. So they are very dangerous. The thing is, is that they don't erupt very often. They tend, to, they tend to be quiet for a long time. And therefore, in the lifetime of people who, who, who are in this region, we forget them. And unless you live on an island like St. Vincent, like Montserrat, like Martinique or Guadeloupe, um, where you have had historic eruptions, you tend to discount the, the, the extent to which they can be dangerous. And therefore, 
your perception is that it's not that dangerous. But they are quite dangerous. Um, they can be have wider impact now because of where we live and, and how we live on, the, on, these, on these islands and how we interact with each other. Um, so I, I would think if you, if you look at, at, they're not as frequent, but if and when they erupt, their impact could be wide ranging both within the country and outside. Okay, uh, have Caribbean governments addressed these things in terms of policy and preparation? Right. Well, I, th I think to a large extent, they, they, to some extent, I will say, not, um, most of the islands that have volcanoes have some sort of emergency plans and mechanisms for, for responding to the volcanic emergency. Um, the fact that you have an agency like the Seismic Research Center, where, where, where I'm working, um, is indicative of the fact that the region thinks that you need to have, um, you need to look at these hazards and, and have them being monitored. Granted, seismic is a legacy from colonial times, but it has continued. Um, and, and yes, granted, we struggle, um, seismic as an institution struggles significantly with the, the level of contribution from, that you have from the islands. Uh, you know, the governments are not always forthcoming in their contributions, but yet, you know, we, we struggle and, on, and, and we survive. So I think to that extent, there's a recognition that that there is a hazard um, that you have to factor into the equation. Um, there's a lot more that can be done, particularly in territories where you have not had eruptions. Um, one, one of the things that we, we at, at Seismic, where we work um, to uh, put a lot of effort in is actually trying to get information and education going both with the islands in terms of the, 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 the general public, if you want to call that, but also we focus a lot on the younger people. And also, we focus a lot on the disaster management community in terms of making sure that they have their plans and protocols in place to get things done. Now, you've been monitoring volcanoes and volcanic activity for the last, how long, 20, 30 years? <laughs> yes, um, okay. I guess I've been in the, I guess, quote-unquote business since 1987. I think that's when I got my first degree. Right. So, what uh, contributions to... The science of volcanoes has the Caribbean experience been able to provide to, let's say, volcanic science generally? Yeah, well, I mean, significant. As I said, one, one, of, the, one of the first places where pyroclastic flows, pyroclastic density currents were studied was in the region. So th that, that contribution goes back from the early parts of the 1900s. Um, you know, St. Vincent volcano eruption in 1902 on Martinique and Guadeloupe taught science a lot. But more significantly, and, and, then, and then you had the, the 1979 eruption, 1971, 79 eruption in St. Vincent, which again published a lot of papers. Um, people got to understand a lot more about the, the ash hazard and the atmospheric effects. But I think significantly, the most significant contribution has perhaps been the Sufra Hills, the ongoing Sufra Hills eruption in Montserrat, um, which began in 1995. And I, I, I think you have had hundreds of scientific papers you have you had tens of PhDs, masters, theses. You have had people who have gotten their 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 um, doctorates and and their, their who have who have been trained both within the region and outside. So the contribution of Sufrails in Montserrat, I think, has been most significant in terms of understanding how dome building eruptions operate. Um, if you if you go and try to um, understand how eruptions that involve domes and collapsing domes um, operate. You can't do but going back to looking at Sufra Hills in Montserrat. So in terms of that, I think the region has contributed significantly. Um, for us ourselves, in terms of seismic, because we have been around for so long, I think certainly um, we have been able to continue that legacy, both in terms of the region and in terms of globally. But more importantly, more recently, I think we have made a significant contribution in terms of how you get science out to people. Our educational outreach efforts um, for the last 20 years or so has been sort of top of the line and one of the places where people uh, look to in terms of um, seeing how you can get um, science information into the public realm. How do you, um, you know, reshape things such that people and, 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 and governments are aware of, of volcanic hazards? So, the region has had significant contribution, both in terms of the science and in terms of how you cope with the hazard that we have to deal with. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's great. Okay. Um, well, in Trinidad, we don't have explosive volcanoes, but we do have mud volcanoes. Could you tell us a little bit about how mud volcanoes work? 
Um, mud volcanoes are not really volcanoes in the sense of what we consider a volcano is. A volcano is really a, 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 a part of the earth where you have magma, a fresh new rock in a sense being created, new parts of, of, of the earth is being produced. While a mud volcano is really the squeezing out of, of mud bodies or, or, or pockets of, of, of fine sediment, if you call it that, which has become um, shaped into, into mud. It's been squeezed out because of tectonic processes and, and because of gas and it has come to the surface. So it has to do more with tecton, you know, tectonic processes and, 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 sh and shaping processes that shape that. So they're not quite, they don't involve magma. They have, it has to do with the fact that because of how Trinidad and places like Trinidad were created by essentially the sedimentation of the, you know, sediments come out from the, the um, South American continent, from the Orinoco, the big rivers come out and they, they produce a lot of um, clays. And over time, because of certain geologic processes, these, these, these clay bodies, these fine sediments get buried. And again, because of conditions to do with the pressure that build up because you essentially you have you have buried them and you find pile a lot of material onto them and then you have gases that are coming through hydrocarbon gases that has to do with the same process of sedimentation this time sedimentation but with 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 organic material these gases help to bring them out to the surface now because of the fact that there's pressure some slight pressure build up they come out and they form similar kind looking features like um like magmatic volcanoes, but the, the forces, the, the, the energy involved is significantly less. And essentially what, they, what you're doing is recycling old sediments that were buried and, and bringing them to the surface because of, of, of some pressures that build up um, in, in that environment. So they're slightly different. Um, but that is not to say that they're not dangerous in the sense that if you then go and build in areas and occupy areas that these mud could come to the surface, they could cause a significant amount of damage and a lot of distress to people who live in them. So I think in places like Trinidad, where you have these mud volcanoes and the potential for mud volcanoes, I mean, you, you need to, to have some element of mapping and determining exactly where they are and perhaps have more regulation in terms of where you what, what you do in terms of whether people can live and where people can live relative to them. I think what has happened in places like Trinidad, where you have these mud volcanoes, is that we haven't, we haven't, utilize the geologic knowledge in terms of what we know about mud volcanoes in terms of how we then plan where people may or may not live and therefore what happens is a lot of a lot of a lot of these areas which should not really be occupied because they're close to these mud volcanoes are occupied and therefore when they do squeeze out some mud and when they do erupt um you know the the, the mud out of them they could cause a lot of damage and distress. You said that there is some level of preparedness in the region. I think there is there is mechanisms at the regional level. So, so organizations like the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management has a has a plan for dealing with volcanic emergencies. And at the level national level, there is some 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 level of preparedness. Um, I I don't think we can be comfortable with the level it is. In some islands, it really is insufficient. You know, in some islands, in fact, where you have a lot of volcanoes, um, places like Dominica, where you have a lot of volcanoes. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, while in others, places like St. Vincent, where you have had a lot more frequent eruptions, the level of preparedness there is significantly more, say, than a place like. Grenada, for example, where they have never had an eruption. And that's the case. And the problem really is how do you get them all to kind of be at the same level, given that some of them have never experienced it. And, and, and that's, you remember I was telling you earlier on that there's this issue about the fact that we're all independent. We're all independent is a good thing, but what that means is that in terms of how we can encompass the hazard, the hazard in the region is, it has to do with the tectonic environment we, we're in, right? So it's, it's all, you know, is all one region, and therefore the hazard is all one. But when we think of it, we think of it individually as individual islands. And if you think of it in terms of individual islands, then your perception of the hazard, which should be, which should be looked at regionally, is different. And therefore your response is often inadequate. As, as is, a, is, a, is a challenge that we have with us being so disunited in a sense, in how we, how we manage things like that. Okay, what would you like to see going forward in terms of regional preparedness for the um, 
for the event of an eruption as has recently happened in St. Vincent and less recently in uh, Montserrat? Well, well, one, I, I think, I mean, and, and this is not because I work at Seismic. I think the extent to which an agency like Seismic and regional agencies that have to ha a task to look at volcanoes are, are securely funded is really significantly inadequate. I tell you, I, I used to be head of Seismic, and, and on an annual basis, I struggle to help us to survive, and we continue to do that. It shouldn't be that case, as the first thing. Secondly, I think the real impact of ash, of ash on, on, on the region needs to be better quantified. It's insufficient. Um, it's not, in fact. We don't really know what will happen if a volcano goes off and it keeps going off and produces a lot of ash. We, we really don't quite understand that. I have, I have some ideas, but that needs to be better quantified. Um, and thirdly, in terms of, and, and sort of related to that, as a region, we need to build uh, more robust plans to respond to volcanic emergency in any particular island. I think we still, to a large extent, are seeing it as the island's problem rather than a regional problem. And it shouldn't be, because quite apart from the ash, there's a potential in some islands, particularly small islands, where it might be necessary uh, or people might feel uncomfortable with what's happening. They may wish to move. Um, and while in some cases, because of the volcanic emergency, you don't have to, the volcano is not going to kill you, you could stay safely in the island, some people may still want to move. And therefore, there's, a, there's an impact on the movement of people. So there needs to be a much more regional consideration of, of, of hazards like volcanic hazards and looked at more detailedly than it is currently. And, and there needs to be better resources and funding given and more stable funding given to agencies that have to respond to that hazard, has to monitor it, has to look at it and give warning. Um, agencies like Seismic and other agencies. Okay. Is there anything you think um, Caribbean people should know that they don't seem to know now about the phenomenon? We are exposed as a region to a certain number of hazards, and our risk to those are, are pretty high. We are much we are one of the most um, hazard-prone regions in the world. The problem is that we need to see that. It doesn't matter whether in Trinidad, you know, you get bypassed by the hurricanes or not very often, and you, you haven't had a big earthquake for a little while. That shouldn't translate to your thinking that you're safe um, you should see it in a regional perspective. It's difficult, but that's how you have to see it. You can't see the problem as somebody else's because once it starts affecting another part of the region, it can potentially affect you either directly or indirectly. So I think we don't accept as a Caribbean people how much we are potentially exposed to the hazardous environment. Wonderful, fantastic place to live. But, but the region, unfortunately, one of the most hazard-prone regions in the world. And therefore, when we, when we plan for our lives individually and, and family and all of that, we can't discount that. We have to make sure that we have a certain level of, you know, what, what, how, you, how you define insurance. You have to have something that uh, enables you to buffer the impact that you might have at some point from these hazards. I don't think we build on that sufficiently. We need to we move, need to move in that direction. Otherwise, we will constantly be struggling to, to sustain the kind of development that we would have. Um, and it goes back to an individual thing, uh, as quite apart from the national thing. I think people see often the response to hazards as a, as a government thing, somebody else, rather than seeing the responsibility to themselves. We individually have to see it as a problem that we have, that we have to try to solve personally, rather than somebody else solving it. Is there anything else that you, you'd like to talk about that we haven't um, gotten into this morning? I would, I would, always, I would always ask that, that, and I think I've said it already, that people recognize that it's important in the region that institutions that are set up and, and are supported for doing a particular task are recognized as such. And it's important that people, for example, if people are looking for information on earthquakes, on, on volcanic eruptions, it's important that the people in the region understand that where they go to find information. And it doesn't help sometimes that we have confused, conflicting and confusing signals because of, you know, you know, these days you have issues of alternative facts and all that kind of jazz that you, you hear about that has come up. I think we struggle with making sure that people understand and see where the authentic voices should be. And I think people need to know where they are. Um, and I think as much as we can support that, it's a good thing. Um, otherwise, 
we have to struggle not only with the fact that we don't have you know resources, but we have to struggle with the fact that the message that we're trying to give is being distorted because of alternative perspectives, which which, which is fine, but people need to know where the alternative sources of information is. And as far as um, you know, the media and, and others out there can recognize that. I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to encourage them to do that, recognize where they should get information um, and, and, and push that so that people are not confused. One of the things with this eruption that is, to me, um, personally and professionally very impressive, as I said, is the educational outreach effort. Um, there's a, I've, I've very rarely seen, and, and I could, I could um, if you remember, I think this was last year, year before, there was an eruption in Hawaii in which the USGS was involved. Um, and you can look, and I could challenge anybody to look and see the effort in terms of outreach to the public versus what you're seeing now from Nemo, from Seismic. And I would bet you that it's unparalleled. And if you think of the resources difference between these two organizations, you will understand the effort that's involved. Uh, so I'm, I'm very impressed with that, that the, the product that is coming out in terms of educating people, the range of things that we're doing. And I think that's a good thing. It's not necessarily a, a thing that scientific organizations do. It's something that we have deliberately invested in doing, um, you know, at an individual level as a scientist, I do it constantly, but also as an institution, we do that. And I think that's a good thing. And I, I hope that's an example of for other scientific organizations in the region that they realize that you can't just do your science. You have to make sure that your science and the information that you have, you put it in a frame that people can understand, that people have available. And that helps to make sure that people take the action that you yourself would like them to take because you want to mitigate, mitigate the impact. Okay. Uh, well, Dr. Richard yeah. Robertson, our 2014 Laureate in Science and Technology of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the UE Seismic Research Unit. Thanks for your time this morning and we, as always, appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been the Anthony N. Sapka Caribbean Awards for Excellence podcast. Thank you for listening and tune in as we speak with our laureates in the sciences, the arts, in entrepreneurship and public activism and present and share with you their expertise. Thank you.